So as soon as we leave this office, I'm getting my <laughs> you know, the budget may not be the sexy document that like everybody wants to hear about, but it really dictates aspects of everybody's daily life. The total overall number for the state budget is somewhere around $250 billion uh, over two years, which is a huge number. But even before it's written, about 80 to 90% of that money is kind of already accounted for. There are all these programs that the state is required to fund, public schools, Medicaid, really only maybe 10 to 15% of the budget in any given year is quote unquote, up for grabs. Every year at the Capitol, people show up and they have a program that's very near and dear to their hearts that they want to see funded. And everybody's trying to sort of make the case that theirs is the most important. You might stage a big demonstration at the Capitol, schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings with lawmakers and their staff. Lawmakers hold these committee hearings in which they ask members of the public to come and make their case. <laughs> Susie Angel has been showing up at the Capitol this session with a really succinct message, which is, hey, look, lawmakers, you guys have $9 billion to spare this session. Care workers like hers and the thousands of others throughout the state deserve a pay raise. She has limited motor control, but she is very independent. She works at this advocacy group that advocates on behalf of people with disabilities. She's in a dance troupe. She's out there all the time. Because Susie has a disability that qualifies her, Medicaid actually pays for a personal attendant to help Susie with the menial tasks of daily life put on clothes, make breakfast, get out the door, or get to work. Andy, is there any way you put one line up? Right now, their base pay is about $8 an hour under Medicaid. What the disability community says is that's not enough money to have a consistent, high-quality workforce. There are nights eating in the church. Sometimes I'm on a time limit and it's, I just can't seem to get anything done. There is a proposal right now in the Texas House that would raise attendance base pay by about 10 cents, which, hey, it's a raise, right? But Susie's personal attendance, she said, frankly, a 10 cent raise is an insult. You know, from the lawmakers' perspective, they're saying there's really not that much discretionary money available. I'll tell you, there's nothing that tells you more about the, the need for something than to see the person who has been impacted by the budget decisions we make. I have a great respect for what they're doing on behalf of all the people with civil disabilities. I'm happy that we're able to move in the right direction, um, but I can't tell you if 10 cents is meaningful or not. Portland citizens have to be familiar with this building. Not everyone's after those dollars that aren't yet spoken for. They have different motivations at the Capitol, whether it's raising awareness about an issue or just trying to advocate for a bill that doesn't have this kind of Allison Franklin uh, currently works with the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition, and they, with her help, are advocating for a bill that would help human trafficking victims. Yeah, so I hope to see you there. Will you be there that day? I'm actually a survivor. How sexual abuse locked me on a journey of destruction that led to addiction, that addiction led to crime, gangs, and eventually being sex trafficked for a decade. And so I know firsthand, um, you know, how many vulnerabilities not only set me up for sexual exploitation, but also cycling in and out of our state bill system. And it was on my night felony that I actually got some type of individualized uh, 
gender specific services that address the root causes of my incarceration. I really did uh, think that I would die out there, especially by the hands of my factor. Let's see here. When I heard Allison's story, I was really compelled to work on this bill and to file it. I think she's perfect to be the advocate and can get people on board to uh, support this bill. It levies the fines on to the buyers of illegal sex. The additional fines that are levied are put into a fund that will then be used to provide pre and post services to people who are most vulnerable to human trafficking. This bill absolutely um, has no fiscal net. It pays for itself, and and that is a huge buy-in from um, several legislators. If you get these individuals, you know, into services uh, that addresses root causes, their chances of, of doing that are a lot better. But when you have a criminal record hanging around your neck that can potentially tether you to a life of abuse and commercial sex work, yes. even when you are trying to do right. And Allison, um, we need to do that. We do. But we'll read the bill and then we'll reach out to the author and ask the author how he or she would like us to, to deal with this. Policy can affect change and the individuals do uh, recover from sex trafficking. They do recover from this. I think it's important to be a face of hope. <laughs>
interest groups. Interest groups, I think, uh, are a great way to, to understand politics. Um, politics is the art of persuasion, influencing policy decisions. That's what uh, a big part of politics is. And interest groups, they want to protect, they want to preserve their goals. They want to distribute uh, benefits to their members. So organized people demand policies that promote their financial security, their education, their health, welfare, and protection. And because government makes and enforces public policy decisions, it is not surprising that people try to influence officials to make and apply society's rules or policies. And it shouldn't be surprising that an important pro approach is through individual group action. And when people organize for political action, they do tend to be more effective in achieving their goals than just one person acting alone. Now, it, it is true that if a group is well financed, money does play a big role in affecting state government and state elections. So what we're gonna do in this chapter is uh, we're going to explain what interest groups are, why they form, what the essential characteristics are, the types of interest groups, the qualities of powerful interest groups, and the kinds of activities that you saw that interest groups use to influence government, primarily lobbying. And then uh, we'll, look at how an, we'll look at how interest groups are regulated and evaluate the effectiveness of these laws. Well, first let's go into what an interest group is. An interest group is a group of people that seek to influence government officials and their policies on behalf of their members. So they share common views, objectives, for example, labor unions or trade associations. These are what interest groups are all about. Now, there are diverse reasons for interest groups. And some have categorized them into three essential areas as to why they exist. The first is for legal and cultural reasons. Uh, we've had them in our country. And de Tocqueville, a famous author from France who came to the United States in the 1820s and 30s, toured the United States and noticed that Americans have a tendency to associate. And this was uh, noticed by the founding fathers, and it was enshrined in our First Amendment, we have the right of assemble or the right of association. That's in the First Amendment. So Congress can make no law denying us the right to assemble. And this was applied in several cases like the NAACP versus Alabama case of the 1950s. And in the Edwards versus South Carolina, 1961 case, we have the right to peaceably assemble and to protest government or make sure government is aware of our, our concerns and address them, redress our grievances, at least to stop, look, and listen to our grievances. Let's take a look at a famous case, this famous Edwards case from South Carolina. Follow and engage with C-SPAN on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at C-SPAN. We had it uh, early that morning and uh, we had different plans. We knew uh, the routes that we were going to take. 
Now, we didn't know the outcome, but we were persistent and said, well, it does not matter. We are going to make a change, not only for us, but for the uh, citizens in Columbia and our future generations. The students who, who gathered in Zion Baptist Church on March 2nd, uh, 1961, were really in the process of continuing a social protest uh, that had been building up uh, in Columbia throughout the early 1960s. Now, they had, many of them had already been involved in marches uh, through towns and communities. Many had been mar involved in sit-in movements uh, at lunch counters and theaters and uh, in bus stations. Uh, many of them had already undergone uh, nonviolent direct training uh, by the NAACP, uh, and yet they remained still quite dissatisfied. Uh, even though Brown v. Board of Education occurred in 1954, uh, they still saw the signs of injustice and discrimination everywhere. We couldn't um, use facilities downtown. We didn't have any jobs available downtown. We uh, didn't have uh, what we knew and termed as equal rights in any aspect of downtown. Uh, in the downtown area and the Colombian in general. But we said, uh, this has to stop. The students, uh, in many ways, were the real thrust of this next phase of the civil rights movement. And so they come to Zion uh, to really to offer a, a, a discussion about the attitudes of young people uh, in the movement. Um, and they saw the march on the State House is not simply an articulation of the NAACP, but particularly the articulation of young people and in their indictment with the failures of South Carolina to move toward equal justice uh, and uh, civil rights. But, but we came together and we talked about it, we strategized, we talked about the peaceful uh, demonstrations and we talked about uh, some of the other things. You know, at that particular time, we had to walk downtown uh, uh, the bus uh, did not uh, facilitate or could not facilitate us, so we just walked uh, to uh, the Zion Baptist Church. They gather uh, for a what one of the students called a mini pep rally. Uh, they hear scripture, uh, they hear prayers, uh, they hear a real call to action. Uh, and then this group of nearly 300 or more uh, are divided into, into cells about 15, and they disperse from Zion, and they really go in multiple directions with the whole idea of converging on the state house grounds. Um, and they all leave Zion. Um, they go in multiple directions, uh, and they travel several city blocks. The whole time, they're being watched very closely uh, by the local police who are already informed about what is happening. Uh, they're already being watched by the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, uh, the state police, uh, who sort of sort of follow their their pathway uh, to the state house uh, at the corner of Javay and Main Street, um, and it is there where uh, the students are confronted by a legal aid of the governor uh, of the time, and are also confronted by the local city police, uh, who make it very clear that they are only given a limited amount of time to be on the state house grounds, uh, no more than 15 minutes. Uh, they're told they can make one sort of march through the grounds and they're asked to leave. They said, yeah, 15 minutes to disperse. Uh, we said, no. Uh, then they came, they had a policeman in the front and in the back and on the side, uh, basically, and they made the arrest. Uh, the lead student organizer of that march was a, an incredible young minister named Reverend David Carter. Uh, he had given instructions to the students about what to do and what not to do, uh, what to, how to dress, uh, how to carry themselves. And so they went sort of going forward with a very clear idea that they would do nothing that would really merit arrest. They would not be unruly. Uh, they would not sort of challenge directly law enforcement. Uh, instead, they would engage in uh, freedom songs and religious songs. Uh, and uh, ironically, they are arrested for their singing. They are arrested in some ways because one of the uh, policemen argued on a stand that they were boisterous and, dis and, and disturbing. And one of the songs they were singing was the South Spangled Banner. Another song they were singing was uh, We Shall Not Be Moved. And another song that becomes quite familiar in the movement 
uh, We Shall Overcome. And all those songs are lifted up in testimony as signs the students were engaged in unruly behavior. 187 are ultimately arrested uh, and charged with a breach of peace. Uh, they are all uh, carted off to the local jails, multiple jails uh, in Columbia. Uh, some who cannot fit into the, in the transportation are literally marched through the streets uh, from the state house uh, to the jails. Um, uh, they are fortunate they have an incredible legal defense team uh, led by Matthew J. Perry, Lincoln C. Jenkins, and a number of other lawyers from around South Carolina. The 187 was really a cross-section of youth activists from around the state. Uh, you had young people from the local colleges here in Columbia, uh, Allen University and Benedict College. Uh, you had students from Charleston, from Greenville, uh, from uh, Camden, uh, from high schools around the state, uh, many of whom were well-trained as youth activists uh, in the NAACP. Uh, during the immediate days of the arrest, uh, the Columbia NAACP team is in direct dialogue with the Attorney General, Robert Kennedy. Uh, they are in direct dialogue with Roy Wilkins, who is the head of the National NAACP. And so they're already crafting a very um, a pur purposeful legal challenge. And in December of 1962, Richard. Attorney Jack Greenberg, uh, who is a part of the National Legal Defense Team of the NAACP, um, presents the, what is now the Edwards v. South Carolina case uh, to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, in February, uh, late February of 1963, uh, the court rules uh, on the convictions of the young people uh, and argues that it was unconstitutional uh, for the state of South Carolina to make criminal the public protest and public assembly. Okay, so you, you see that the right to peaceably assemble, of course, is part of the Constitution and it is definitely applied to the states through the cases Edwards versus South Carolina. Now, the, there are other reasons there's the decentralized government of the United States where you have separation of powers at the national level and at the state levels where you have a judicial branch, an executive, legislative branch in all 50 states. And then within the state, you have municipalities, you have townships, school districts, special districts. So the government structure itself provides multiple access points for these interest groups. So just the, by the very nature of the structure of our federal system, we have increased opportunity for individuals and when people gather together, they find more success. So interest groups, pressure groups, special interest groups, it's all the same thing. They form and they try to influence government. For instance, uh, Bike Texas is mentioned in your book on page 240. They've been trying to get legislation to protect bicyclists on Texas roads. And they sometimes go to cities. Like they've gone to Austin, El Paso, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and even in Laredo and been successful in uh, getting uh, bike lanes. The third reason is the lack of the party strength, the party ideologies, the absence of unified parties. Parties uh, are very decentralized and there's not very strong ideologies amongst most Americans. Public officials rely on their constituents uh, or on the issues. They're not ideological. They're more practical and Texans are very practical people. Now, what are the characteristics of interest groups? Well, there's certain things we've identified, such as the people that join an interest group sometimes join simply because they want to be part of a network of like-minded individuals working for a cause. Uh, they provide members with information, benefits, and usually try to involve them in the political process. 
you know, there are many organizational patterns as there are interest groups. The variety from the fact that they, most interest groups perform non-political functions that are of paramount importance to their members. Some interest groups are highly centralized and they take the form of a single controlling body. An example of such a centralized group currently operating in Texas is the National Rifle Association. Other groups are decentralized, consisting of a loose alliance of local and regional subgroups. Their activities may be directed at either the local, state, or national levels. Um, as far as the membership, let's go over that. Interest groups are, ch are chiefly composed of persons from professional or managerial occupations. And members tend to be uh, better educated, but to have better resources. Uh, members are more likely to be homeowners with high levels of income and formal education and usually have a higher standard of living. Now, participation, especially active participation, varies. Many citizens are not affiliated with any group, but some members of, are mem uh, people are members of several groups. Now, an organized group of any size usually comprises an active minority and a passive majority. The decisions are made by relatively few members. So these decision makers, they may range from a few elected officers to a larger body of what we call delegates representing the entire membership. They generally leave decision making and other leadership activities to a few people. Usually there's just apathy amongst the, uh, the rank and file members. Now on page 243, here's a list of Texas's professional and occupational associations. You can see that there are, they're varied. Texas dental, hospital, medical, ophthalmological, nurses, physical therapists, counseling. Some of these interest groups you'll want to be involved in and they're all online and you can seek out their uh, websites online if you show, so choose. Then there's the, a lot of you are in criminal justice majors. These are some of the ones you probably want to check out. Uh, here's some more in education. Some of you have indicated you're an education major. You've got Federation of Teachers, College Teachers, Classroom Teachers, Parent Teachers, Library, Faculty Associations. So there are quite a few. Some of you go are going to be engineers, architects, or certified public accountants. These are ones you probably should get involved in. Well, let's get into the specifics of the types of, of uh, interest groups. Um, there are what we call economic interest groups. They promote the members' economic interests. There's business economic groups, and they obviously want to lobby for policies that favor Texas businesses. They advocate lower taxes or lessening uh, the elimination of price and quality controls by government. The gaming association, they favor creation of destination casino resorts in the state. Texas Association of Builders, okay, they're going to focus on creating a positive environment for the housing industry. There's also labor organizations. And labor organizations, they're going to seek governmental intervention to increase wages. 
um, obtain adequate health insurance coverage, provide unemployment insurance, and promote safe working conditions. Sometimes they go to the state capitol and they have these uh, rallies. My name is Osadeba Umatero. I'm from Fairview A&M University. I'm a sophomore in agriculture and economics concentration major. Make these things and kill my dreams. Make these things and kill my dreams. Get all the federal money we can get and find new revenue. Hi, my name is Vince Dixon. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. I'm a retired Teamsters and I've been a public worker in the union for the past 25, going on 30 years. And I'm here representing my Teamster brothers and everything. And uh, with these cuts that are state is trying to cut out and everything. If they were in effect a few months ago, I wouldn't be alive today because I'm living on the heart pump right now. It's a bridge work till I get a heart transplant. And without being alive, I've got a lot to be thankful for. The unions and the health care program that I had as being a member of the union and everything. And uh, I just like to see it passed on to future generations. The, the health care that we've had in the past, I don't want to see cuts and that's for my children and other people's children and everything. I'm Benny Ogletree and I'm from Houston, Texas and I'm here with my home health care provider group and we are here to fight against them cutting our budget. We don't want them to cut shit. And we have a lot of people that need this money. We do not need to have anybody cut from this. Getting paid to work, we need people to give them their medication. They need people to Make sure that they, they're fed and they clothes are washed. We need all of this. And and we have people that can't talk. We have people that's blind. People in wheelchairs. They need this. We're with uh, Reaching National Independence in San Antonio. We're here to, to do the fight for people with disabilities. This is Mike. He lives in his new home. I'm here because I, I, want, I see my Medicare and why we're here. Said, I see him cutting a group home to be, be in the street. So uh, I'm here to, to protest to help them you know, get their budget. Can you tell me your name again? Michael Castro. It's, uh, the uh, current budget cuts go through as proposed. It will probably reduce private providers by about 37%. That means that uh, over... 5,000 people will be left without services in our communities. And could you say your name and title, please? Pamela Kelly, Executive Director of RMI. Why are you here today? To vote for our rights to, to live in our group home. Uh, my name is Annette Jennings. I'm a board member with RMI and a parent of a daughter with disabilities. I am here just because I want to make sure there's services in the community that are available for her. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Witte. I'm from Austin, Texas. I came from South Austin. I'm here because I'm on a program called Client Managed Personal Attendance Services, and they're going to cut my services by 50% in House Bill 1. That means that I will probably not be able to live in my own home and in the community. As a person with disabilities, that concerns me. Right now, my options are if I can't have community services, live in my own apartment, that um, one of the options that I've actually had experienced in my past because of my uh, my disability is living in a nursing home. Well, even those options are not going to be available because of the 30 to 40 percent budget cuts for nursing homes. And I don't realize living in a nursing home, I would never choose that as a first option. I probably, with all of the options as they are right now, laid out on the table if I lose my services, I'll probably become a, another homeless person out in the streets of Austin. There's a lot of folks here who uh, may not realize the impact of the budget cuts they're making until they actually come down. And there's certainly a lot of folks who voted for these representatives and senators who are making these budget cuts and the folks back home in all parts of Texas will feel the full impact September 2nd when these budget impacts go into effect, September 1st and 2nd. So there's going to be a lot of people who are wishing 
that it was um, that they would use the rainy day fund, but even the rainy day fund will not be enough to save Texas. Thank you. Very Thank much, you. Sir. So in that case, you saw the labor group, uh, specifically the Texas State Employees Union, which, re which represents a lot of those caregivers uh, protesting the uh, proposed cuts in a bill to education, health care, and maybe state jobs in the 2011 legislature. So these unions rallied on the steps of the Capitol uh, expressing their opposition. So they're trying to promote and protect this, the really the interests of the workers to keep them employed and prevent budgetary cuts during the legislative session. Now, they were not successful during that lobby day. Now in, in the 2015 legislative session, the state workers did get a pay raise, uh, but the pay raise was allocated to mandatory employee contributions to the state retirement fund. So the pay raise did not put more money in the employees' pockets. So it's a tough road for some of these groups. And even though they pull out all the stops, sometimes they are not uh, going to be successful. Uh, professional public employee groups like State Bar of Texas, healthcare associations, they're more successful. Uh, they have more resources. So their organization who lobbies for policies beneficial to their members does get a lot of things passed like the Texas Medical. They got a, a constitutional amendment, Proposition 12, that authorized the state legislature to impose a $250,000 cap for non-economic damages in medical malpractice cases. Now, sometimes they're su successful, but sometimes in recent years, uh, TMA has been unsuccessful. To, uh, they wanna improve the Medicaid system by ensuring medis uh, physician medic uh, Medicaid payments uh, under the Patient Care Act uh, is available to more Texas patients, but that hasn't been successful. Then there's teacher groups um, the last time teachers were successful in significantly increasing salaries was in 1999. They constantly go to the um, legislature every odd year and they do lobby outside the state capitol. Now, public officer and employee groups like the Texas State Employees Association, which represents government employees, they lobby for legislation that prevents job cuts, increases pay and health care benefits. Uh, the Texas Public Employees Association, uh, with more than 15,000 active and retired state employees, that's uh, the oldest and the largest group. There's also the Texas City Management Association, the City Attorneys Association, the Police Union Association, law enforcement associations. Now we also have social groups. Uh, there's groups like racial and ethnic association, civil rights organizations, gender-based organizations, religious-based organizations, and each one lobbies uh, for things that affect them directly. Like the N Texas NAACP, they oppose making a Confederate battle flag image available on specialty Texas license plates. And they were successful. They appealed to the Texas Mo Department of Motor Vehicles to prevent legitimizing a symbol that they felt re uh, represented brutality and fear. In fact, that went all the way to the courts in the Walker versus Sons of the Confederate Veterans. And the court said that uh, license plates signified government speech 
and the state had a right to reject these plays. Then there's public interest groups and they promote general interest of a society rather than the narrow private interest. An example would be the Texas League of Conservation Voters. These are some other ones against drunk driving, um, Equality Texas, Texas Wildlife Association. Now powerful groups are the so-called elite groups, then they represent businesses, professional associations, labor unions, and they have strong links to the legislators and bureaucrats. And they're always there. They have a lot of resources. They have headquarters in Austin. Um, let's take a look at some of these. Here's one, the Texas Wine and Grape Growers. You wouldn't think it, but they're a powerful interest group. You have voted for the lawmakers in the Capitol to represent you. But hundreds of people you did not elect are trying to sway policy and create power out of connections. They're the lobbyists who work for all sorts of groups, from the energy industry to school districts. KXAN investigator Kevin Schwaller takes a look at who's behind a lot of the money and the lobbyists in the halls of the Capitol this year. In the halls and offices of the Texas Capitol, voices getting paid for influence are vying to pass agendas. They're the guys who, or the women, who carry the money from one place to another so that the rest of us can feel like our hands are clean of a system that we all know is driven first and foremost by money. Jason Sabo says lobbying can be used for good. Sabo founded a lobby firm called Frontera Strategy. People tend to think about the big companies who are up there but there's also a role for pretty much everybody else. These are the big ones. If Texas politics were a sport, AT&T is the Dallas Cowboys with 66 lobbyists on their roster, but plenty of other companies are in the big leagues too. Dallas-based energy company, Energy Future Holdings, and its subsidiaries each appear in the top five. Texans for Public Justice monitors the lobbying game. Research director Andrew Wheat says it's not only the quantity of the lobbyists that matter, but the quality. These top lobbyists are the ones with the best connections, uh, the closest relationships. To see an example of how interests play a role in Texas, look to last session. Tesla Motors pushed to change the rules so it could sell cars in Texas. Uh, Tesla got nowhere. Why? Because it was coming up against hundreds of car dealerships all over the state that is one of the most organized lobby interests in Texas. In the game of lobbying, Sabo says, there's no off season. Kevin Schwaller, KXAN News. And to give you an idea how much some of these groups could be spending to lobby lawmakers, ethics records show AT&T is set to pay lobbyists between 2.7 to more than $5 million just this year alone. Let's hear from a lot, uh, one of these energy lobbyists. What was your most important takeaway working as a Texas state lobbyist? focused on energy efficiency. Texas's legislative session is only from January through May every other year. And they may have special sessions to address specific issues, but really for a state this size, it's, uh, it's rare that you would have as compact a, a, a legislative session as what we have. And just working near it for one of those sessions was um, a very eye-opening experience about how fast things move. Literally thousands upon thousands of bills get filed and um, the, the ways that that different organizations and different individuals and different legislators can influence and shape that bill going through or not. Um, and and the, the ways that it can get hung up or stopped or blocked or killed. Um, it, only a very small percentage of bills actually go through and get passed. And, and it, it was a very interesting experience to watch the way that it, how important it is to get all of the stakeholders and affected parties together to get as much consensus on language in a bill before it starts moving through. And then likewise to get plenty of legislators who are understanding the issue, understanding why the bill makes sense and knowing that there's consensus on it in order to allow it to move through. And the urgency was, is, is such an important looming factor. It, it's amazing how fast things need to move and how, how 
how many steps there are to get through before the end. And so it's the system is fundamentally set up to where it needs to be something that everybody can get behind. Otherwise, it's going to have a tough time going all the way through all the steps by the end of the session. So this brings us to, um, you know, the really the key thing that we started the chapter with, and that is, you know, what do interest groups do to influence Texas government? Well, I think you, you've you already guessed, you already know, um, it's lobbying. That's the number one thing. And lobbying is just communication. That's all it is. Lobbying is communicating and trying to influence government officials on behalf of a special interest. Now, it can also mean uh, doing a favor, maybe giving a gift, and that is legal up to a certain point, and uh, helping a candidate by mobilizing public support on an issue with use of things like commercials, the internet, social media. Yeah, but the primary one, like she was talking about, is to make sure the stakeholders get them all involved in a particular issue or a bill or a proposed law, and then uh, making sure that all the legislators, the, the important legislators know uh, what's going on. If you're if you are interested in becoming a lobbyist, um, this is the way to become a lobbyist. Hello, Career Sighted. My name is Josh Sanderson, and I'm a lobbyist. A lobbyist's job primarily is to work with decision makers, work with elected officials on all different levels, all the way from um, city councils, school boards at the local level, to legislatures at the state level, the governor's office, all the way up to Congress and presidential administration. And our job is to work with them to change laws or to make laws that are favorable for the people who we represent. A lobbyist's job is to be an expert in a certain field and then go and educate elected officials on those issues so that they have input from the people that they represent on the issues that they're working on. Most of the goals that we work on are long term. They're not something that happened overnight. If you get frustrated easily, then this is a very difficult field to work in. There is no typical day. Being a lobbyist has been described as 99% boredom punctuated by 1% sheer terror. Sitting in a committee hearing, for instance, you never know when you're going to be called up front in front of a panel of senators to testify in front of 200 people in the audience. When legislatures are meeting, when laws are being openly State discussed in rooms, we meet with elected officials, with their staff, and meet with them personally in order to help educate them on policy issues. The most difficult thing often is to convey our ideas and change that person's mind who, at the beginning, did not agree with you. We can travel often. I'm based in Austin, we go to Washington DC often. When you leave the office and you go home at night and turn on the news, they're often talking about things that you worked on earlier in the day. If in middle school or high school, you decide that you want to work in politics, you want to work in policy and lobbying, I highly suggest polishing up and concentrating on communication skills. Pay attention to that in English, your writing. Pay attention to that in speech, take debate. That's highly beneficial in this area. History, political science, government, take those classes. People who become lobbyists get here in a variety of ways. The most common way is... Well, this is the lobby area, hence the term lobbying and lobbyist. That they have political science backgrounds in college to some degree. The most important thing before you actually start lobbying is to know how the process works. The process is set up to kill laws. It's very difficult to actually get something enacted. I highly suggest working for elected officials first. Learn the process where you will be working before you start working to try to change that process. Go and start at the bottom, get involved with the campaign, block walk, knock on doors, make phone calls, interact with campaign staff. And from there, you build relationships. You understand the most basic components of getting elected and what elected officials are. Often that- Again, here's the lobby area um, in the state Senate evolves into working for people who you help to get elected. Most of the people start off as interns in the House of Representatives or in the Senate, and then they work their way up 
can be very stressful and it can be very rewarding. And I'm fortunate enough to work on an issue such as public education, something I believe in. Thanks, Career Site. Well, the second half of the coin is electioneering. This is active campaigning on behalf of a candidate or an issue. So you do your issue advocacy, you publish, publish the political records, you arrange speaking opportunities at meetings, you publicly endorse them, you get out the vote for particular candidates. These are all part of electioneering. And then there's finally the campaign financing by your political action committee that you set up. Now, in Texas, there's no limits, as we recall from uh, chapter five, except in judicial races, you can contribute as much as you want to a, a state candidate. Now, there are federal limits for federal candidates, but there are no limits on state offices. These are some of the top Texas contributors in the 2013-14 Texans for Lawsuit Reform, Empower Texans, Republican Party of Texas, Act Blue, which is a Democrat organization, Annie's List. That's a woman's pack that tries to get women elected that are pro-abortion. These are some of the recent ones, the top individual and non-individual donors to Texas 2019 and 2020 races. Um, some of these names may be familiar, like Gary Gates Jr. Um, some of them are just rich individuals, the Hunt brothers. Um, these are top groups like Texans for Lawsuit Reform, Texas Realtors, Lone Star Project, Texas Medical Association, Texas Trial Lawyers Association. Now there are bribery and unethical practices that do occur. Most common form is when an elected official agrees to vote in a particular way for a, for a particular item or in exchange for can, campaign contributions. And it gets you know, representatives in trouble like in the Sharpstown banking scandal, which resulted in a, half the house representatives losing their seats or in Billy Clayton's uh, example when he accepted, but he didn't spend a $5,000 intended to influence awarding a state employee insurance contract. So he was found innocent of all bribery. And in fact, he was elected to a fourth term as Speaker of the House. Later, he became a successful lobbyist. Uh, Gib Lewis, he was indicted on two misdemeanor ethics charges. And rather than face a trial, he agreed, agreed to a plea bargain was fined 2000 and announced his decision not to seek re-election. He became a lobbyist. Tom DeLay, he was a representative from Texas who was a uh, former um, whip in the House of Representatives. He organized a Texans for a Republican majority or trim pact and it raised money for GOP candidates seeking seats in the Texas House. And he helped on the redistricting efforts in 2003. Um, he was charged by a Travis County grand jury for money, money laundering, but after he appealed it to the Court of Criminal Appeals, they threw it out. Now there is a regulatory arm, the Texas Ethics Commission in New and new ethics laws passed since 1991. Um, you have to disclose and describe any gifts valued at greater than 250. And you do have to do reporting of all the money you receive and how it's spent. Uh, but you can see that a lot of these former legislators, they go uh, into lobbying after they leave office. This is the so-called revolving door policy. Uh, there is something called late train uh, of money that does occur and dark money. This is a phenomenon 
that's become increasingly present in campaign contributions. You got people that will anonymously give to a nonprofit organization and the nonprofit does not have to disclose the names of the contributors. Now, since Citizens United, we've seen independent expenditure groups, they can accumulate as much money as they want and spend it on behalf of a candidate, but they just cannot give the money uh, to the candidate. Now, there are research that indicates a strong relationship uh, between the larger socioeconomic conditions in a state and the power of interest groups. Um, if you have a state with high population, advanced industrialization, significant per capita wealth, high levels of formal education, that's going to produce relatively weak interest groups and strong political parties. We have a large population, um, but we have strong interest groups and weak political parties. Uh, the Center for Public Integrity, they gave us a D in terms of transparency and accountability. And an F in lobbying, disclosure, political campaign financing and accountability. So that implies that there might be some uh, corruption. Some say our constitution uh, creates a lo state local governments that is weak and then uncoordinated. I think it's issue dependent um, in assessing the political power and influence of interest groups. Uh, there's no simple top down or bottom up arrangement. You know, political decisions are made by a variety of individuals and groups. Some of these decision makers uh, participate. Yeah, the political influence of any interest group really cannot be fairly calculated by looking at only one political asset, whether it's money, status, knowledge, organization, sheer numbers, social media capabilities. You know, they do have some influence, no doubt about it. And the unorganized citizenry is at a great disadvantage when public issues are at stake. So if you do want influence, become a member of an interest group. And there are a lot of interest groups out there that um, you should join. If you are gonna be in criminal justice or the medical industry or physical therapy, and this will make you more influence in Texas government. So uh, let's review. Um, let's go over what an interest group is again. It's a group that seeks to influence government, not run the government. And they have intermediaries for, uh, that, sh that want to do that, lobbyists. And there's three reasons for interest groups, legal and cultural reasons, the right of association. We have a decentralized government, a lot of access points. We have a lack of party system and political ideology, especially in Texas. And there's a lot of different characteristics of interest groups. Uh, people join for various reasons, financial, professional, just or just plain social reasons. Some are more centralized, some are decentralized. Now the members tend to be like you. They tend to be educated. They have resources. Most people that join though are passive. And there's always an active minority that assumes uh, roles in office. Here's a list of groups that you will get involved in. Now there's many types of interest groups, but generally there's several big areas. Economic interest groups promote the members' economic interests. Labor groups, they wanna support policies to increase wages and improve health coverage, promote safe working conditions. Then there's professional groups. This is a power group, 
just like the business interest groups. Power, group, uh, power groups like professional groups want to lobby for policies that are beneficial to their members. Then there's public officer and employee groups. Social groups like racial, women's, religious based and public interest groups. Here's a list of these. Now the most powerful are the business, professional and labor groups. And they have common traits, those three key tra common traits. Now, what do the interest groups do? Well, basically uh, three things. They lobby, that's personally communicate, sometimes offer favors, gifts, get the grassroots mobilized, the electioneer on behalf of the candidate and give the candidate money for his campaign. Now the money can be troublesome and we don't have a very strong law uh, and it can get into bribery and unethical practices. We have the Texas Ethics Commission only since the 1990s. And really they're just a, a place, a repository for disclosure reports. And since Citizens United case of 2010, uh, really it allows uh, unlimited amounts of money to be collected by political action committees and spent on behalf independently of candidates. You cannot give it to the candidate, but you can spend it on behalf of a candidate. These are so-called super PACs. The relationship between these campaign contributions and policy decisions is unclear. So in conclusion, uh, we can say that, you know, there are numerous interest groups. They exert tremendous influence over public decisions at all levels in all branches of government. Some have more influence than others. They participate in an assortment of activities. They use lots of techniques to influence government. Um, and the regulations in Texas don't really effectively control the power. But you gotta recall, what, is, what did I say at the beginning? They're protected, all of us, you, I, we are protected in organizing. It's our right of association. It's a fundamental liberty. It's in the First Amendment. And you've got to keep that in mind when you think about interest groups. You have the right to organize and to play a significant role in Texas politics. Thank you for your attention.